It is my great privilege to um, introduce this year's Alexander Langmuir Lecturer, Surgeon General of the United States, um, Dr. Jerome Adams. Dr. Adams is passionate, personable, and plain spoken. His professional educational roots come from Indiana, Berkeley, and not to be forgotten, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, this year's Cinderella team. Surgeon General is disappointed that his most popular tweet of the year was about this team. <laughs> but we are anxious to retweet everything he tells us today to help that public health message go even further. Um, the theme of the Surgeon General's tenure is better health through better partnerships. And he starts those partnerships at home with incredible um, support to the CDC and the commission officers here within our agency. Um, we have been claimed to be his most frequent visiting site, and that's getting him in trouble. So we are so grateful that you were available to speak with us this year. I also recently learned that in the movie version of his biopic, um, he will be played by Kevin Hart. So <laughs> please join me in welcoming Surgeon General of the United States of America, Dr. Jerome Adams. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Dr. Shuket, for your kind and uh, jovial introduction <laughs> and for organizing this conference. It's a great honor and a great privilege to be able to address each and every one of you. I'd like to thank Dr. Robert Redfield. I had to write that out and, and break it apart because I always want to call him Dr. Or Dr. Robert Redford. But Dr. Redfield is much better looking, much better looking. Thank you for your continued leadership and service to public health and to the sciences. And I am extremely excited to work with you. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier about how the days can be long, but the years are short. And we're committed to working together and to working with each and every one of you to get as much done as possible in the times that we're both blessed to, to have to be in these roles. Thank you, uh, Deborah D. and the rest of the officers at the CDC Commission Corps Activity Office for your hard work and your commitment towards better service. You truly live the values of the United States Public Health Service each and every day. I also want to give a special thanks to Rear Admiral Ann Shuket for her remarkable leadership at the CDC and her service. Thank you, Dr. Shuket. As Dr. Simone mentioned, and it's worth reiterating, she's a proud alumnus of the EIS program. And she exemplifies all that the United States Public Health Service and the EIS program stands for. And since she embarrassed me, I will share with those of you who don't know that she was played by Kate Winslet in the movie Contagion. So the next time someone tells you that epidemiology isn't sexy, you send them to Contagion and say, yes, it is, because Dr. Shuket made it sexy. <laughs> she is a prime example, particularly for those of you who are interested in pursuing this pathway, of the impact that EIS can have on one's career path towards future public health leadership. You know, EIS alumni have gone on to become CDC directors, leading scientists, acting surgeons general, assistant directors general, regional directors, and county directors at the World Health Organization, public health and medical and faculty school uh, deans, and state epidemiologists. And that's just to name a few of the prominent positions held by EIS alumni. Four of the 14 CDC directors who assumed the position were graduates of the EIS program. 
Many have furthered their commitment by joining the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. Today, over 6,600 active duty officers serve our country to help carry out the Commission Corps' proud legacy and tradition of public health service. And since 2014, 131 officers have followed in Dr. Schuchat's footsteps and joined the Commission Corps as active duty officers in the EIS program. I'm really proud to say Dr. Redfield and I had a wonderful discussion and we both 100% agree that the core is stronger when we have involvement in EIS and that EIS is stronger when we have involvement of the core. To state it plainly, the EIS program has trained some of the most successful leaders that have made and are making an impact in the field of public health through scientific excellence and through service. And I look forward to the many contributions that each and every one of you will continue to make in the field of public health as EIS officers. Before I go on, I'd like to take just a moment to remember the life of an EIS and Commission Corps officer who was an incredible asset to the field of public health. This is a person who I had the opportunity to meet during one of my trips to Atlanta. I had the opportunity to speak with his parents and his loss is felt deeply by all of us. Commander Timothy Cunningham. We're deeply saddened by the news that he will no longer be with us physically, but we know he'll be with us in spirit for the rest of our lives. I'd like for us to take just a moment of silence to remember him. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today as the Alexander Langmuir Lecturer. You know, some people grow up wanting to be athletes. Some people grow up wanting to be actors and be in a movie like Dr. Shookit. <laughs> some people grow up wanting to be rock stars. I am telling you the God's honest truth when I stand here today and say that ever since I was a little kid first interested in science, I dreamed of standing on a stage speaking to a CDC crowd like I am right now. This is such an honor. <laughs> Dr. Langmuir was a visionary public health leader whom, I'm, whom, whom I consider to be one of the uh, forefathers of epidemiology, specifically shoe leather epidemiology. He was known for stressing the importance of investigators going to the outbreak areas with boots on the ground, hence the name shoe leather epidemiology, to collect their own samples for analysis. And uh, those of you nowadays, well, I'm glad we have our lab folks with us because uh, if we all had to go out and collect our own samples, maybe some of you wouldn't be in, in epidemiology. <laughs> but, uh, but, but he really advocates for us going out into the public to tackle the public health problem at a grassroots level. As we'll talk about in a bit, I've seen this firsthand as a state health officer. I've seen the power of epidemiologists and EIS officers in particular being in the field and being able to not only talk about the science but to translate it into service and into policy. It was under Dr. Langmuir's tutelage and vision that the epidemiolo Epidemiology Intelligence Service was first developed. 67 years later, his influence is still felt today. This is evident to me as I hear about all the fascinating investigations, and those were some great poster presentations out in the hall, uh, by the way, that the EIS and LLS officers have, have conducted this past year during their training. I was looking over a few, just quickly uh, pulling through, and um, you know, it's like a snapshot of what's going on throughout the country in terms of public health. I saw Kirsten Candace's study on near real-time surveillance of fatal drug overdoses in Washington State, particularly relevant considering I just released an naloxone advisory here in Atlanta a few weeks ago. Brunellis White's examination of the public health laboratory response in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria had the opportunity to be on the ground right after the last Category 5 hurricane hit 
in Puerto Rico and in the U.S. Virgin Islands and to see how decimated those resources are, to see why it's so important that you all are available to respond to disasters that occur throughout our country. Uh, the TED Talks, anyone go to the TED Talks yesterday? They were amazing. Crowdsourcing, um, GIS halting the spread of polio in Somalia. I thought that was particularly innovative. When I was a state health officer, I wish we had been able to utilize that type of technology to, to track disease and outbreaks that we had in Indiana. Uh, I remember having uh, several instances where we had to track people uh, who were possibly exposed to TB. We had to figure out which houses we'd been to, which houses we hadn't been to, where to follow up. It would have been tremendously valuable to have, to have been able to do that. So that's a great innovation. Blood, sweat, and sometimes tissue samples. That's a heck of a title. But it, but it shows the importance of labs in the public health response. I came in as a state health officer during the time of Ebola. I, again, was, was very quickly indoctrinated into the importance of making sure we have a strong connection with our laboratory partners as we mount a public health response. The untold stories of men who have sex with men in rural America. Most of you know a little bit about my history and know that I've had to deal with stigma in rural America. Critically important that we continue to recognize that disease and response and stigma all play out differently in different areas. What works in New York City doesn't work in rural Mississippi. It's critically important that we look at these different populations and make sure we have interventions that are sensitive to the culture and the environment. Food behind bars when food safety isn't enough. Another great TED Talk and particularly relevant to me, I'm gonna steal some of my own thunder here, but uh, I have a family member who's incarcerated right now. I took my uh, 13 and 12 year old kids to go visit him just a few weeks ago, and one of the things we talked about was the poor quality of the food. The fact that my, my kids actually commented, we give our dog better food than what they receive in there. Today, the EIS Fellowship is the only applied epidemiology training program of its kind in the United States. It embodies public health service with officers working on the front lines across the United States and all around the world, protecting all Americans, whether they're in prison or whether they're in rural America or wherever they may be, from health, safety, and security th threats where they live, where they learn, where they work, and where they play. They're using science to drive and spur public health action. The work of EIS officers is exciting, amazing, and laudable, and it's sexy. Right, Dr. Shookit? <laughs> See, you embarrass me. I got, I got many more coming. <laughs> I love her, in case you all haven't recognized that. I'm so proud of her. The theme of innovation strongly resonates with me. Your theme of moving innovation from science to service. You know, one of the quotes that I'm fond of is Albert Einstein's, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And those of you who have heard me talk before know that I will frequently bring up that quote. We have to innovate. We've got to do things differently. If we want a different result, if we want a better and healthier future, we must think outside the box. As public health professionals, it's important that we lead from where we are and that we have the courage to think of and to promote innovative solutions, no matter the opposition that you may face. Innovation is the only way we can make an impact to enrich the lives of others. And this was evident to me back in 2015 when I was the Indiana State Health Commissioner. Again, as I mentioned earlier, and as many of you all know, there was a devastating HIV and hepatitis C outbreak in Scott County that year. At that time, more than 90% of the people diagnosed with HIV were co-infected with hepatitis C. It was with the help of EIS officers deployed through EpiAIDS that we were able to curtail this outbreak effectively. We did something truly innovative, not just for Indiana, but for all of rural America. We instituted a syringe service program. Indiana State Health Department received three EIS officers that played a critical role in our surveillance of this outbreak and our messaging to the community. 
officers were on the ground assisting with data analysis, data creations, contract tracing, and testing, and even press conferences, all of which were instrumental in helping us understand and explain the nature and the scope of this outbreak. It was with the leadership from EIS officers, other health professionals, and other non-traditional partners that we were able to bring this terrible outbreak under control and make the Scott County story a story of national success instead of a continued tale of woe. The experiences I had and the lessons I learned during that HIV outbreak, including working with EIS officers, are exactly why I treasure the opportunity to be your Surgeon General. Because I've seen public health innovation and partnership change lives firsthand, and I want more of it. I'm going to take a minute and go over my priorities as Surgeon General because it's important that you all know what I'm focused on since I've had the opportunity to hear about what you're working on across the country. As a United States Surgeon General during my tenure, I plan to focus on health and national security, the correlation between health and economic prosperity, and our country's growing opioid epidemic. And I'm going to tell you why I'm focused on those areas. In terms of national security, when you look at elections, the number two issue people consistently vote on is safety and security. I probably should have prefaced that by saying health rarely makes it into the top five or even the top ten. But the number two issue people vote on is national security. Seventy-one percent of our 18 to 24 year olds are ineligible for military service because they either can't pass the physical have a criminal record, or can't meet the educational requirements. So our nation's poor health isn't just a matter of diabetes or cardiovascular disease 25, 30 years down the road. We are a less safe country right now because we're an unhealthy country. And that's a terrible statement to have to make, but it also presents us with a tremendous opportunity. We're out there fighting over budgets and fighting over resources who always gets a raise when Congress passes a budget? It's the Department of Defense. We have National Guard units and military installations in every state and territory across our great country. If we can show the connection between health and being a safer and more secure nation, we'll be able to tap into those resources, both fiscal and from a manpower point of view, and we will be able to not only improve health, but make our country a safer place to live in. I've been working with the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force Surgeon Generals, and they're eager to work with each and every one of you. And as you all go out to the communities that you're going to work in, or that you're already working in, I encourage you to think about the, the military uh, brothers and sisters out there who can be non-traditional partners and can, who, who can help you in your mission. My second priority is health and health in the economy, health and economic prosperity. I told you the number two issue people vote on is, is safety and security. The number one issue people vote on is jobs and the economy. Again, Democrat or Republican, if you go back through pretty much every election for as long as we've been alive, jobs and the economy, number one. Well, we know that communities that are more prosperous are healthier. They can afford to invest in health. I want to make the case the other way around, that communities that are healthier, where we invest in health, will in turn experience greater prosperity. And I'm going to give you an example of why this is important, because I'm one who likes stories. When I was Indiana State Health Commissioner, I uh, was invited to be a part of our tobacco study committee before the legislature and they were debating over whether to raise the taxes on cigarettes. Indiana has some of the lowest in the country. We had over two hours of testimony from the experts. The experts telling us smoking's bad and if you raise the cost of, of tobacco, smoking rates will go down. At the end of that two hours, we had about 15, 20 minutes of testimony from the business community. The business community was represented by the gas stations, the mom and pop bars, the casinos. And they actually didn't refute anything we said. They said, yeah, we understand the science says that, but you know what? 
it's bad for business to raise the cost of tobacco. So I ask you this question. The next time we have a meeting, what do we do? Do we bring more experts, at least in our traditional way of thinking about experts? Is that going to be successful? I don't think so, because the legislature looked at two hours versus 15 minutes and said testimony was, was mixed. And so we're just going to table this issue. I would contend that we need to bring our business partners to the table, the partners who know that their number one expense is salary and their number two expense is health care. We need to figure out how to bring them to the table and carry our water for us to make the real business case for improved health in our communities. We need to do it in a language that resonates with folks, with voters, and with policymakers. And it's for this reason that I want to put out a Surgeon General's report on health and the economy. And I'm excited to work with the CDC to make this happen, but I encourage you each and every time you're in communities to think about engaging business partners and to ask yourself, what is the business case, the prosperity case for the intervention that I am proposing? Because being in policy positions for the last several years, I can tell you we need to have the science, but that's often not enough. They knew what the science said in Scott County, Indiana, that a syringe service program would help us stop the spread of disease. But the business community was worried it would hurt their ability to, to bring tourists to their town. We had to make sure we engaged the business community before they were willing to listen to the science. It's important that we can make the moral case for what we believe in. But again, the moral case doesn't always apply. As shocking as it is to say and as shocking as it is, as it is to hear, there are a lot of folks who don't care that there are people who are using substances that are getting HIV, that are getting hepatitis, that are dying. Unfortunately, the moral argument falls on deaf ears because they think those people deserve what they're getting. But if you can help them understand how it impacts each and every one of them, how it impacts their bottom line, you're going to be able to bring them to the table and engage them. My final priority is addressing the opioid epidemic. Today in America, addiction is a public health crisis. An estimated 2.1 million people in the United States struggle with an opioid use condition. There's a person dying of opioid overdose every 12.5 minutes, and more than half of those individuals, shockingly, are dying at home. I want you all to think about that. There's a person dying every 12.5 minutes, and if half of them are dying at home, that means every 24 minutes, we could save a life because someone's on the other side of that bathroom door, that bedroom wall, that garage wall, who could have intervened. And I've talked to countless mothers who've lost their children who said to me, if only, if only I'd had access to naloxone, perhaps my son or daughter would be here with me each and every day. You know, opioid addiction impacts our family and our friends, members in every community, from the high school athlete recovering from an injury on the field to the stay-at-home suburban mom who was given way too many Percocet for her C-section, from the black male in downtown Atlanta to the white female in rural Scott County, Indiana. It even affects your United States Surgeon General. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier, my own brother Philip, my little brother, is sitting in prison right now. He was given a 10-year prison sentence for stealing $200 to support his habit. So it's important that we understand people with opioid use disorder, our, our friends, our neighbors, our family. And if we're going to be really honest, statistically speaking, some of you. Statistically speaking, there's someone in this audience right now who has an opioid use condition. And because of stigma, because of lack of resources, because of lack of recognition, they're afraid, they're unable to come forward. For me and for many others, the opioid crisis, it's not only pressing, it's personal. And I know you'll talk more about the opioid epidemic tomorrow during your special lunch session at the EIS conference, 
but I want to stress that we all have a role to play. This isn't somebody else's problem. It's all of our problems. And I've been committed to finding the ways in which my office can be most impactful. The three areas that we're currently focusing on are prevention, education, and the lock zone. On the prevention front, we're helping providers understand how to be better and safer prescribers and helping patients understand how to manage their pain safely and how to keep their medications safe from others. On the education front, we're helping people understand the scope of the crisis. Recent publication in the New England Journal by Bob Blendon, about half of the country, just over half the country, thinks the opioid epidemic is a problem. Less than that number, about a quarter think it's a problem that rises to the level of an emergency. And even a smaller number thinks it's an emergency in their community. It is critically important that we help folks understand the scope of the crisis. There's additionally a, a, another shocking statistic in that study. About half of the country doesn't think that there is effective long-term treatment for people with substance use disorder. If folks don't think there's effective treatment, then they're certainly not going to support spending more money on treatment. They're not going to support the things that we know are evidence-based. So we've got to help folks understand that effective treatment does work, that recovery is possible. And we're trying to do that, working with each and every one of you to educate our communities. And then finally, as you all are aware, I'm focused on saving lives by helping everyone understand what naloxone is, and who should be carrying it, and, and how anyone can save a life. I released the first Surgeon General's advisory in 13 years, again, here in Atlanta, just down the street a few weeks ago, with the goal of bringing awareness to and highlighting the use of naloxone in opioid overdoses in the United States. Surgeon General's advisories are reserved for significant moments in public health and are a call to action in critical public health areas that demand our immediate attention. And based on the number of people we're losing each and every day, the time I've been up here, we've lost at least one person to an opioid overdose. We must do more. 77% of opioid overdoses occur outside of a medical setting. And as I mentioned earlier, more than half occur at home. So we can't just rely on calling 911. That's why I'm urging more Americans, especially individuals, including family and friends and those who are personally at risk for an opioid overdose, overdose to carry naloxone, a life-saving medication. No part of our country, no community, and no neighborhood has been spared. Therefore, we all may find ourselves with an opportunity to save a life. I carry naloxone in my briefcase. I've got it in the room right now. We need to make it that ubiquitous. If someone were to have a heart attack, in front of us right now, we'd expect that there would be any number of people who'd be able to come up and do CPR. If someone were to have an asthmatic attack right now, we'd expect that any number of people would recognize they probably need an inhaler and be able to locate an inhaler. If someone had an allergic reaction, we'd probably be able to recognize it and someone in this room would probably have an EpiPen. But we can't say with confidence that in a room of this size, folks would recognize what an overdose is, much less that we'd be able to count on someone in this room to have naloxone. We absolutely need to make sure it is as ubiquitous as CPR, as understanding that we need a defibrillator in every public place, as understanding how to recognize the signs and symptoms of an anaphylactic reaction and what you need to do to respond. And it's important that as EIS officers and as public health advocates, you understand you have a role to play in addressing the opioid epidemic number of ways you can assist. You can help us with surveillance in areas that are the hardest hit. You can help us track trends in fatal and non-fatal overdoses, trends in drugs being used, coroner reports, naloxone procurement and tracking. You can help us ensure the integrity of disease surveillance. You can help us share data. Does us no good if you all collect all this great data and we don't get it out into the hands of people who can actually respond to it. And you can help us by educating communities and public health professionals. I mentioned this earlier to some of the EIS officers. You can also play a role by being a leader in your communities. 
it's not just an opportunity, but I'd say you have an obligation. Being an EIS officer, it's a special privilege. You're in a unique club. You don't just have an opportunity, you have an obligation to be a leader in your communities, to talk about the science behind syringe service programs, to talk at church, at the softball field, or the soccer field, or at the grocery store, about what medication-assisted treatment is, to talk about the need for folks to carry naloxone and to help them understand that we're not enabling drug use, we're enabling recovery when we save a life and connect people to treatment and recovery resources. You know, if I'm being honest, there's a lot to do, and at times it can be overwhelming. At these times, I ask myself the proverbial question, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And I encourage each of you to think about how you can take that bite of the elephant and how you can partner with other people. Because if any one of us has to eat that elephant alone, we're not going to get there. But if all of us took a bite out of an elephant, right up here on stage with me right now, we'd have that elephant eaten in no time at all. My motto is better health through better partnerships. And whether we're looking to combat the opioid epidemic, improve our nation's health outcomes, increase our economic prosperity, or improve our national security, we all need partnerships and we all need collaboration. When we're addressing multifactorial health concerns and complex and at times controversial policy solutions that are important to improving our nation's health, we cannot operate in silos. We can't keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. As public health professionals, we all have unique opportunities to leverage our influence and our leadership to convene stakeholders to forge greater partnerships that can more effectively promote public health and prevention. As Surgeon General, I'm committed to using my platform to strengthen connections within the public health community and to forge those new partnerships. These partnerships must include the business community, must include the educational community, the military community, the law enforcement community. Another sad reality, who's the biggest mental health provider in our country? It's our prison system. They don't want it be the biggest mental health providers, and we know that's not the best case for mental health uh, care to be provided, but that's the reality. We're not going to solve our problems by excluding law enforcement and not, not partnering with them. And faith-based communities. In many cases, they're the soldiers on the ground addressing the social determinants of health already, but we don't invite them to our table. We don't go to their table. We cannot achieve our individual or mutual goals unless we're at the table together, sharing lessons learned and challenging each other to do more, to do better, and to do it together. Partnership, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. It's really, really hard to do. So here are some practical tips that I've picked up on over the years uh, to help forge new partnerships. You've got to go to their table, but just importantly, you need to invite them to your own table. It means so much more to someone when they feel like you're engaging them where they are, that you're inviting them to contribute to your discussion as opposed to implying that we know all and that we are going to help them with their problem because we're the almighty CDC, I'm the Surgeon General, we're the public health folks, we know everything. You've got to show them that you care. Anyone heard of motivational interviewing, community engagement? I'm a physician and one of the frustrating things about being a physician is someone would come into my office and they'd have high blood pressure and I'd send them home, tell them to exercise and come back in a few weeks. Then I'd uh, They'd come back and they'd still have high blood pressure. And then I'd tell them, change your diet, come back in a few weeks and they'd still have high blood pressure. Prescribe them a little uh, Norvask, send them home, come back in a few weeks, still have high blood pressure. W well, at the end of the day, I'm trying to tell them something that I think they should do, but I haven't asked them what their priorities are. If instead I'd ask them, you know, what's important to you in your life? Well, I want to I want to see my kid graduate. Well, you know, 
That's really important. You've got to validate their priorities. That's really important. Let's work on your blood pressure so that we can make sure you're not in the hospital and you can, we can see your kid graduate. And let's, let's set out these goals, these things that you can do. And that's motivational interviewing. And we've got to do a better job of motivational interviewing and community engagement in public health. Because as some of you, again, have heard me say, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. I learned that lesson firsthand in Scott County. And some of you have heard me share this story about the sheriff down there. Uh, Navy SEAL, uh, very conservative, was very uncomfortable with the syringe service program. And folks, maybe some of you in this room, because there were articles written about that terrible health commissioner in Indiana who didn't have the courage to just say, by golly, the science says you need a syringe service program and I've got the legislative authority to do it, so I'm going to declare an emergency and go in this community and just give out needles to everybody. Well, if I'd done that, that sheriff would have set up a perimeter around my syringe service program. He would have stopped everyone coming in, checked them for drugs, arrested them if they had drugs on them, and my syringe service program would have been a colossal failure. But I went down there. I had a beer with the sheriff, so if some of that beer is still available. <laughs> it's very valuable. It is a public health tool. <laughs> had, a, had a beer with the, with the sheriff. Asked him what his concerns were. He said, you know, I'm concerned about my prison being overcrowded. I'm concerned about my officers getting stuck by needles. I'm concerned about, about enabling youth. And I said, well, you know, you're right. Those are valid concerns. They really are valid concerns, Sheriff McLean, and I want to help you solve or address those concerns. And here's how we're going to do it. If we work together and we get the syringe service program stood up and working properly, the studies show that there's going to be a 60% decrease in needle stick injuries to your law enforcement officers. If we do this right and get people connected to care, we're going to stop that revolving door at your jails. If we do this right and engage the community, we're going to bring in more dirty needles than we're putting out uh, clean needles, and we're going to help clean up the streets. And by asking him what was important to him, by showing him that I cared, he then was my biggest advocate for standing up the syringe service program. Number three, you've got to know your audience. You've got to speak in a language that resonates with that audience. And I'll just encourage you, if you haven't had a chance to read it, to read The Eleven American Nations by Colin Woodward. It's a great description of different groups in different areas. And, uh, I'll tell you another quick story that epitomizes the 11 American nations. I was in uh, Switzerland, and uh, I was asked to, it was given 10 minutes and asked to des describe the American healthcare system and it, to, to a bunch of people who, who, uh, who, who knew nothing about it. Easy peasy, right? Here's the story that I told them. Paris, France, and Berlin, Germany, two cities where they speak a different language, that are in different countries that in the last great world war literally tried to obliterate each other off the planet are more aligned on the top health issues, issues like universal access to health care, issues like gun safety, issues like contraception and abortion, issues like harm reduction. Two cities that are in countries that if they had their way during World War II, the other one would not exist, and who speak different languages are more closely aligned on those issues I just named than what Boston, Massachusetts, and Dallas, Texas are. So when you think about that, you've got to understand that as effective EIS officers, as public health advocates, you've got to know which land you're in and you've got to know which language resonates. And the 11 American nations give us some tips for recognizing which land we're in. Another publication, RWJ, a new way to talk about the social determinants of health, gives you some practical tools for language you can use that will resonate. Language around opportunity. Everyone should have an opportunity to live a long and healthy life. Uh, your neighborhood shouldn't be hazardous to your health. Uh, those two were, were both very, very practical uh, bits of reading that helped me be a more effective public health advocate, but you've got to know your audience and speak in their language. 
I want to finish with a call to action. I encourage you to continue to strengthen your partnerships and forge new ones. EPI-AIDS and other field resources are important ways that CDC can collaborate and engage with health departments and build strong relationships. I know we've got some state health departments out there. My own state health department is represented. Hey, guys. Indiana's in the house. We can tell you from personal experience, receiving EPI-AIDS can help increase the technical capacity and workforce available for rapid response, can streamline access to CDC subject matter experts and laboratory resources, can build capacity through collaboration, and can enhance public health relationships. And I can tell you, it was powerful to me to have a CDC EIS officer standing next to me when I'm trying to explain to a community why we need a syringe service program and how we're going to dig ourselves out of an opioid epidemic. I also encourage you all in my call to action to publish your work. Far too often, we're recreating the wheel over and over and over again. And as EIS officers and as public health advocates, we're just running from fire to fire to fire and not sharing lessons learned. That's why this meeting is so important. Your investigations inform public health prevention and treatment efforts. When you engage in your work, make sure you're getting the word out about what you're doing and how you're doing it. And a great way to do that is by publishing in public health reports. This is known as the Journal of the Surgeon General. And 30% of our authors actually are from the CDC. But we want even more of you to consider publishing in public health reports or wherever you feel appropriate. I'd also to encourage you to think beyond scientific journals, op-eds, TV, radio, social media are all effective ways to reach our tar target audience. You know what's interesting is in Scott County, and today they just had, I'm proud to say they just passed uh, their, their renewal of their syringe service program. It was hairy. I mean, they, they were unsure if they were going to do it. Scott County is known as a success all around the country, but you know what? They're known as a, as a success in JAMA and in the New England Journal and in Time Magazine. They don't read that in Scott County. They read the local newspaper. They read Facebook. We've got to reach people where they are. We've got to do a better job of being effective health communicators. And I also want to take this time as I finish to remind everyone that the EIS application process for the class of 2019 opened on Monday, April 16th. I encourage others to apply. I want to state strongly to each and every one of you that you're seen as a leader in your community. Again, being affiliated with the EIS program, being a current or former EIS officer, means you have a responsibility to lead by example in your communities. And you don't have to wait until you become the next Surgeon General or the next CDC director. You can lead from where you are right now. Even the folks who aren't in the EIS program, you can lead from where you are right now. It's imperative that all of us use our platforms to maximum effect, and that starts with humility, and it starts with servant leadership. I challenge each and every one of you to think of at least one non-traditional partner whom you can invite to your table and whose table you can go to. My motto is better health through better partnerships, because no matter what area of public health you're passionate about, if you commit to forging better partnerships, being a better partner, and innovating from science to service, better health is sure to follow. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure, and it is, again, a great honor to be your United States Surgeon General, and just as much of an honor to stand before you here today and be, have been able to deliver this prestigious Langmuir Lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before we get going, I got to soften you all up because I don't want you asking me any really hard questions. Or if you do ask me hard questions, I want you to be nice to me about it. You guys come on up and take a selfie with me. Because everyone knows that I love selfies. And I want you to want to see the future of the EIS. And we'll be taking some questions after the selfie, so you can get to the microphone.
they want a picture of all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, thank you, sir, for your comments. Uh, I particularly appreciate your laser focus on uh, opioids and opioid overdoses. However, as, as I know you're well aware, polydrug abuse is very common. And so I wondered if you could just comment a little bit on your thoughts about addressing other um, problems such as excessive alcohol use, misuse of other drugs such as benzodiazepines, many of which often um, occur uh, concurrently with opioids, contribute to the risk of overdose and to a variety of other health problems as well. That is a wonderful question and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to address it. The opioid epidemic is a tragedy, but it's also a tremendous opportunity. A tremendous opportunity. You know, two, three years ago when we were first dealing with the Scott County situation, if the average public health person had called up their local sheriff or their local mayor or their local head of housing or their head of their local chamber of commerce and said, I want to meet with you and let's have a round table about a health issue, maybe one of them would have shown up. You'd be really, really lucky if two of them, but all of them wouldn't have shown up. And if we're being honest, probably none of them would have shown up. This opioid epidemic has provided an opportunity for us to bring all these partners to the table. They're now clamoring to come to the table to figure out how we can address this terrible scourge that has affected everyone across society, black, white, rural, urban, rich, poor. And so we need to take advantage of that opportunity, not just to talk about opioids, but to talk about addiction in general. And not just to talk about addiction in general, but to talk about adverse childhood experiences and trauma. And not just to talk about adverse childhood experiences and trauma, but to get upstream and to talk about how do we build resilience? How do we create communities where wellness is a priority? We have that opportunity and I am convinced that I'm not going to waste this opportunity playing whack-a-mole and simply trying to tamp down the opioid epidemic alone, but that we are gonna use it to lift up all the things that we know contribute to healthier and, and, uh, and more vibrant communities. So uh, that, that would be the, uh, the, the answer I would give you, but it's the one that I, I believe in my heart is the, is the right one, the right way to go. We can't get caught up playing whack-a-mole. What we do in each and every day of our jobs is critically important. It's important that we figure out how to treat people with individual diseases as best we can. But as someone who's been in public health for over, over 20 years, I get a little frustrated playing whack-a-mole. You know, the communities that are suffering from the opioid epidemic, Scott County, also has the highest cancer rates in the state. Also has some of the highest cardiovascular disease rates in the state. Has the highest smoking rates. Um, has the highest high school dropout rates. Uh, we need to figure out how we can heal these communities and not tamp things down over here and wait for them to pop up over there. And again, I encourage you all to take advantage of the opportunity, uh, the wind in our sails that we have right now. Okay. Thank you. Ken uh, Castro, I'm a professor at Emory, a retired uh, flag officer from the Public Health Service. Sir, thank you for a very inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, I applaud uh, your Surgeon General's advisory calling for more ready access to naloxone. So if you'll bear with me, I'll share a short story with you. Uh, I did my internal residency program in Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, New York. And uh, by the end of my three years, there was one guy whose life I may have saved as a lone ranger in the emergency room with naloxone. He was found unresponsive over my three years there. Uh, at least three times. It was routinely uh, one of our interventions was using naloxone. One of the things that frustrated me was that we never did anything to get that guy into rehab services. And uh, so my question to you, and I know that you mentioned it here, is how do we make sure that the call for naloxone does not undermine the very necessary rehabilitation services 
that need to be part of that prevention process uh, so that we rely less on the locks and ideally do more at the other end. Ken, thank you. It was Ken, right? Yes. Thank you so much for your service and thank you for that great question. Uh, one of the things that I've been adamant about after uh, leading up to and after we uh, release the advisory is naloxone is necessary. It's extremely necessary, but it's like a tourniquet. And I'm an anesthesiologist who worked at a level one trauma center. Someone got shot in their leg, we'd put a tourniquet on, we'd bring them into the operating room, we might do a quick damage control surgery, but we wouldn't send them back out onto the street that's what we're doing right now with naloxone uh, and, and with overdoses and folks who come into our ERs. Our system is broken. What I want folks to do is not only to understand how naloxone can save a life, but to use this advisory as an opportunity to lift up what a comprehensive community recovery print, uh, program looks like. And that includes making sure we have warm handoffs, making sure we're increasing treatment capacity, making sure we've got recovery support services, and making sure we're talking about prevention to your kids, to my kids, making sure we're, we're working on prescribing. This advisory is not just about naloxone, it's about making sure everyone is aware of how they can lean in to this opioid epidemic and, uh, and properly respond to it. So please take advantage of it. Um, please use the naloxone advisory to get some wind in your sails to have that discussion about what good treatment looks like. Please also um, help folks think outside the box. The theme of your conference is innovation. We will never have enough inpatient capacity to be able to provide inpatient treatment services for everyone who has substance use disorder. That's just a mathematical fact. We've got to innovate and th rethink the way uh, we've traditionally looked at treatment. Outpatient treatment can be just as effective. Uh, we need to, to innovate in, uh, in so many different ways, and we can, but we've got to have the courage to, to do so, to think outside the box. And if you all can help us do that, we'll be in a better place. Hi, uh, Betsy Schrader, EIS 2016, Indiana State Department of Health, and my fiance is actually from Scott County. Mm -hmm. um, so. What the, I guess the question I have is, in places like Scott County and, and, and um, uh, kind of communities across you know, the, the country, you start to see some fatigue um, when it comes to you know, the, like the needle exchange programs um, or, or, or those types of services that are, continue to be so critical and so life-saving. So I was just curious if you had any thoughts about how to kind of keep that messaging going, um, to kind of keep people engaged so that way they're not completely burned out, I guess. So I, I actually had this very conversation with some of the EIS officers just before I came in here. Stigma is a terrible thing. And we have to be aware of the fact that a lot of our data that we put out is doom and gloom data. Your community's got the highest chlamydia rates. Your community's got the highest overdose rates. Your community's hepatitis rates are through the roof. Your community's HIV rates are, are, are through the roof. We've got to make sure when we're putting that information out, we're doing it in a scientifically valid way. I'm not saying we should in any way, shape, or form not present the data, but we've got to make sure we present the good along with the bad. We present the recovery stories that are out there. We present the upside to that data. This is how many uh, folks we've averted from getting cervical cancer by providing HPV vaccine. Uh, in Scott County, for instance, one of the things we constantly pushed to do, that I fought for, was making sure um, not only we, that we talked about the number of syringes that we were able to pass out, because that's a metric that matters to us, but in a community that doesn't want syringes out on the streets in the first place, that thinks we're enabling, to tell them we handed out 30,000 syringes, we, we in, our, in our public health mind go, yeah, right on. And the community, in their mindset, goes, what the heck are we doing? But if we can say, we connected 100 people to addiction and recovery support services. We got 20 people vaccinated against Hep B last week. We connected another 50 people to insurance coverage. Uh, we, we connected another 25 people to job services. If we can pre uh, present the positive statistics as well as the good, and that starts with being cognizant of the fact that 
I, I don't want to say we're the problem, but we can't be that steady drumbeat of bad news and not expect people to get down on themselves. Uh, if we can prevent the positive along with the negative, then I think we'll help prevent or overcome that compassion fatigue. Nothing is more depressing to folks than to find here that, well, for the third year in a row, overdose rates are going up, so what we're doing doesn't seem to be working. But nothing is more empowering than to hear the story of someone who has overdosed four or five, seven, ten times, but then finally was connected with a recovery support coach and finally was able to get good treatment with MAT, and finally was able to get into a recovery program. People like Jonathan, who I met in Rhode Island, whose father overdosed and died, whose brother overdosed and died, who himself overdosed multiple times, but then finally was able to get connected to a recovery support coach in the ER, and now is a recovery support coach himself. That's the kind of story that can help counterbalance the negative news that we are constantly putting out there. Thank you. Thank you for the really lovely talk. Um, Diana Reiner, LLS, 2016. So we always hear over and over again the science of addiction. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the actual trying to increase our understanding of the neurobiology of how addiction works. Because again, a lot of what we're talking about are kind of like band-aids, but they're not getting to the root of what's causing this. Well, one thing that's interesting is that uh, NIH got a lot of additional funding this year and uh, Dr. Redfield and I are committed to working with Dr. Collins to further explore the, uh, and, and promote the exploration of the, the neurobiology of addiction and to look at not just how we come up with better treatments uh, for folks who have substance use condition, but also how we come up with better pain management alternatives that, uh, that again can hit the right buttons without hitting the wrong buttons. Uh, so I, I think it's critically important. I think it's another place where we've got some wind in our sails to have a discussion now about that topic that we wouldn't have had a few years ago. So tragedy also uh, brings opportunity. Hi, I'm Kelly Shaw and I'm EIS 2017 based in the uh, Virginia Department of Health. And I appreciate your point about bringing more partners to the table to kind of have a multi-pronged uh, uh, attack on this problem. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how we can avoid uh, perpetuating disparities in that case, because I think what can be seen as a medical problem in one population may be seen as more like criminal behavior in another population. And uh, how we can kind of... Um, you know, work with our partners to, you know, not perpetuate that. Disparities are, are a big problem, and there are a couple of different slices of, of that pie that we could go into, and I, I want to be brief here. Um, one of the most common questions I get is, why are we caring about addiction now that it's a bunch of white men getting, uh, being affected when we didn't care before when it was minorities, people of color, uh, being affected. On the flip side, well, uh, actually, uh, in response to that and on the flip side, what I say to folks is stigma is when we can separate a group of people into us and them. And for far too long, we've been able to say, us, we're good, and them, they're bad. Uh, now, we can't say that anymore. Everyone's been affected, and it presents, again, a, an opportunity. We should always learn lessons from the past so we don't repeat our mistakes. But uh, instead of dwelling on the past, I'm focused on the future. So what's the future, to your point of not worsening disparities? We want to make sure the funding, the attention that's on the opioid epidemic is distributed in a way that decreases disparities and doesn't increase disparities. And there's a real, uh, real example I can give you when you look at diversion programs, giving people alternatives to incarceration. A lot of times those are being offered in more affluent communities because they're resource intensive and so you need to have the resources to make it work. And the folks who are most likely to be successful are the ones who have resources already at home. If you've got an intact family, if you've got a job waiting for you, if you've got a home to go to, you're going to be more likely to be successful. So it's another place where the science can, can, can actually worsen disparities because they look at it, well gosh, the science says 
these, com these communities are going to be more successful, so we should invest our resources there, that we actually can worsen our, uh, our disparities. I would say I'm committed to making sure we shine a light on the fact that all communities are affected and helping those communities that are hardest hit or most resource poor get their fair share. So another thing that I'm, and I'll say this with uh, Dr. Redfield in the audience, uh, he and I haven't talked about this, but uh, every time I come down to the CDC, I, I try to bring up the fact that we've got to, we've got to do a better job of, of uh, in our grants process. And you all are part of that when you pull together the data. One of the frustrating things that I see happen over and over again, and I've seen as a state health officer, is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The communities that already have the resources can put together the best grant applications, and they get a 90 out of 100 on the grants. And the communities that are most at need, that are struggling to get by, who don't have anyone, don't have a, a, a grant writer, who, who don't know how to go through this process, get scored 30 out of, out of 100. And based on our objective criteria, well, gosh, we've got to give it to the people who scored 90 because it wouldn't be fair to give it to the people who scored 30, but we're worsening disparities because, again, we're giving it to the folks who already have the resources and not to the folks who don't. So as we look towards the opioid epidemic and any of the other diseases that, you're, that you care about, think about how you can help build capacity in those communities. Think how you can help them more effectively apply for grants. Think how you can bring folks together and help them get access to the resources so that we're lessening disparities and not worsening them as we're responding to crises. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and visit us. We're honored by your presence, sir. Reina Tercios, Reis EIS, EIS Class of 2001. I particularly appreciated your analogy of Paris and Berlin. Um, in terms of how many more things in common we have with our global network of partners. And I wanted to ask you about the role that you see of this agency, NHHS in a broader sense. What role do you envision us playing with our global partners? There are many lessons that we can share with our global community. There are many lessons that we can learn from the experience with our global partners. Would you elaborate on that? Well, number one, I would say that Dr. Redfield, um, Secretary Azar, and I are committed to the global security mission. One, uh, remember I told you uh, folks prioritize security over most other health issues, and the more we can frame this as a security issue, I think the better able we'll be to be able to, in, to, to engage uh, on our global health front. I think it's important for health's sake, but we've got to make the case that it's important beyond that. Uh, so that folks recognize why it's important for us to be on the ground in Africa preventing the next Ebola outbreak from occurring instead of waiting for it to occur. Why it's important for us to be in countries dealing with Zika um, where it is instead of waiting for it to become something that, that comes to, to, uh, to our state. So I think there's lots of lessons learned. Uh, the flip side is we have to be careful because, uh, and I don't want to make you all mad at me, this is a public health crowd, but as I alluded to earlier, public health can be arrogant. We think we have the science, we think we have the moral high ground, we think we've got the study that says this worked in Australia, so by golly, you need to do it in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And we come and we bang people over the head with it and we call them bad, we call them ignorant because they don't want to listen to our science. We've got to realize that in Jackson, Mississippi, they don't give two hoots about what worked in Australia or what worked in London or what worked in, uh, in Germany. Uh, we need to do a better job of meeting them where they are, going to their communities, and also, again, publishing best practices. Scott County, one of the things I'm most proud of coming out of Scott County is that Kentucky, based on what happened in Scott County, went from zero to 50 syringe service programs. They didn't do it because of what happened in New York. They did it because of what happened in Scott County because they saw a community that looked like them do this and they were able to relate. The more we can help folks uh, understand where these places are relevant and, and show them the similarities, the more successful um, we will be. And uh, again, I think there's lots of lessons learned from global health, but we've got to be more effective about communicating those lessons uh, in a way that resonates with people across our country. 
Uh, thank you very much for your remarks, uh, Anne-Marie Kimball from the Global Health Security Unit of Chatham House and also EIS 1977. Along the lines of the last question, your remarks about defense and uh, health were really intriguing. And one of the things that many people have come to a consensus of, especially after the experience of Ebola, is that global health security requires universal health coverage and a resilient health system. And I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts sitting in your chair, looking at our country, about universal health coverage and its relation to our security from epidemics and pandemics for the American people? Again, that's another one that's got multiple slices and I'll try to just mention a few things. Number one is your Surgeon General, I believe, access to high quality health care is extremely important for our public health and health mission. I believe that with every fiber of my being. I will also tell you that there is a lot of debate, and we know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about how you define what health care is. Uh, here's a shocker for you. We already have universal health care coverage. It's called EMTALA. Any one of you, if you have a, an accident right now, if you're having a baby right now, if you're having an emergency situation right now, can go into any ER in this country and it's illegal for them to turn you away. Our universal health coverage that comes through Mtala is just very inefficient, very, very costly, and we know that we need to do more than that. But what does more than that entail? On the other extreme, does it include making someone who thinks it's a sin to provide an abortion pay for an abortion? I'm just putting that question out there. Does it include dental coverage? I think it should, but a lot of people don't. Does it include cosmetic surgery after you've had a, uh, had a cancer um, excised? Uh, what, what does that include? And I think that just as I mentioned about the differences between Boston, Massachusetts, and Dallas, Texas, um, it's going to be hard to adjudicate that on a national level. I think we need to continue to push the conversation about what essential services are or should be and the science. This is where you all can help us figuring out where we get the most bang for our buck from investing in a certain level of essential services. What's the floor? But I think politically we get in trouble when we try to pack too much into what that needs to be and then force it down everyone's throat. And so as your Surgeon General, uh, again, I'm committed to continuing to foster that conversation about, well, the science says that if we invest in oral health, we're going to save more money, we're going to have lower taxes, we're going to be a more prosperous community. That's why I want to do a report on health and the economy. The science says that if we invest in smoking cessation services, we're going to lower health care costs for corporations and be a more attractive town for people to move to. The science says that if we invest in a diabetes prevention program, then maybe the Michelin plant won't move out of South Carolina because their diabetes rates are through the roof and it's costing them an arm and a leg. That's how we, I think, can really lean in to this issue and push the ball further down the field towards that goal of ensuring a certain level of health care resources to everyone. On the flip side, we have to make sure folks understand that only 10% of our gains is going to come on the health care side. 90% is going to come on prevention and wellness. And so we also have to get away from obsessing on health care and make sure we're having a conversation that is comprehensive and includes the spectrum of community wellness because we're falling into that trap of continually addressing only the 10% and ignoring the 90%. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions. Um, please join me in thanking the Surgeon General for his work.